I want you to all do this, exactly what I'm doing. Look at them like you're this. <laughs> Surprise them with so much. <laughs> okay. who's, who's in here after us, just out of curiosity? I do not immediately know. Yeah, because I'm making up those 10 minutes, guys. Yep. Uh, that's what we call self-help. Okay, good. So we can make up the time if you all like. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? I am the Boozy Badger. Sitting next to me is Mr. Mark Whipple. He, we are both attorneys. Uh, he is the better attorney. I just kind of scream at people and shit post. Uh, actually, in all reality, I will allow Mr. Whipple to introduce himself. Uh, how before I will, I will say, the gentleman sitting next to me, uh, the first furry convention he ever did was last year, this one where he showed up to participate in this panel with myself, and uh, who is now Buddy Good Boy Esquire, but at the time was Grandiose Toad. Unfortunately, uh, Buddy was supposed to be on the panel with us tonight as well, but the nature of the practice of law is sometimes shit doesn't happen, and you can't do anything that you wanted to do. And this weekend, as Buddy was getting ready to get on his plane, uh, shit done happened. So, uh, it will be the two of us tonight. I will allow Mr. Whipple to introduce himself after I flatter him. The gentleman sitting next to me is probably one of the preeminent and best trademark and intellectual property attorneys you will ever meet. Okay, I'll give you that one, because I don't know how many you're going to meet. Somebody is raising their hand and they really want Let's something. Let's get the introductions done first. All right, hang on. I promise we're going to take yes, it. Yes, I swear. Uh, I am Mark Whipple. I also answer to Legal Inspiration or Legal Inspire because Twitter has stupid handle length requirements. Uh, that's how you can find me at LegalInspiration.com or Legal Inspire on Twitter. I have been mostly an in-house counsel, which means I've worked for companies as opposed to working for law firms like you always see on television. Uh, those companies have usually been entertainment, game, entertainment, toy, game, and video game companies. So I have had a lot of fun. Uh, believe it or not, in this career. I am very unusual, I'm very lucky in more ways than that, but we'll start with that one. Uh, right now, I do work in what most people consider a regular law firm. I have a, of counsel to a firm, uh, which is just a fancy way of saying they don't accept responsibility for me in the way that they would most associates and partners. And I came up because Boozy was like, I, I knew him a little bit before he got adopted by you fuzz butts. And adopted is the kind word. I, that's the you word I'm going to go with. And I said, well, if you ever do a panel on one of your cons near me, we have to do a panel together. And he invited me up, and we've had fun. And my wife, who's also in the audience, and I have been going to cons of different kinds for many years. And we've been enjoying a few of these. So thank you. We, we have done, Mark, uh, I think you and I have done some version of this panel at three or four different conventions together now. And uh, by the way, what the hell is wrong with you people? Um, like every convention that I do lawyer horror stories at, I grab like one or two other furry lawyers. Like pe people who have been in the community much longer who are attorneys, and they sit up there, and the room's always full. Why? Uh, my, my, my bona fides. I am the Boozy Badger on Twitter, the Boozy Barrister on Twitter, the writer of lawyers on liquor.com. I game, I do YouTube shit, all of that. Uh, my name outside of furry conventions is John Tabor. I'm a licensed Pennsylvania attorney. I'm admitted to the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, meaning I can practice in any trial level court in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania as well as all appellate courts there. I am a litigation and trial attorney, although I work at a more general practice firm. I'll take a little bit of anything if it comes to the door, criminal law, civil law, anything like that. I'm also a licensed federal litigator admitted to the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, Western District of Pennsylvania, Middle District of Pennsylvania, and the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, I keep toying with the idea of getting admitted to the Supreme Court of the United States, but the simple fact is, guys at my level do that because it's something nice to hang on the wall, not because you ever actually expect to have a case in front of the Supreme Court. Of plus, the plus States. you get another vacuum cleaner certificate to hang yeah. right behind you. Yeah, I mean, and that's what it is. Like, you go out there and you get admitted to courts and crap, and they look really nice on the wall. Like, people look at that, like, oh, you're admitted to the Supreme Court. And I'm like, yeah. They're like, have you ever argued a case? And I'm like, no, but I could. I stand ready. You know, I, by the way, I definitely, there's like a dozen guys in the country who make their living only arguing in front of the Supreme Court, and they're really fucking good at what they do. 
It's like when you go to law school. What do you want to do? I want to be a constitutional attorney defending the First Amendment and only that. And I'm like, there are like 20 people in the country that do that, and they are all really good, and you're not going to be one of them. <laughs> so. Oh, and I forgot to say, I am licensed to practice before the Supreme Court of Illinois, which means I can practice in the court in the state of Illinois. And the general bar of the Northern District of the State of Illinois Federal Courts, which means I'm not allowed to actually do anything, although I can go and make appearances and look really cool. <laughs> and I also have a registration from the United States Patent and Trademark Office, which is a separate license, which means I can do pra practice patent law in the United States Patent Office, which is not unique to any state. There is one quick disclaimer we have to do before we start taking questions. Foreman, this is kind of a question and answer. You guys ask questions, we answer them about the practice of law. Uh, life as an attorney, some of the cases we've had, if we can talk about them, things like that. If you traumatize us, you will know you've traumatized us. We are very clear about that. However, the disclaimer is as follows. Yes, we are licensed attorneys. We practice law on a daily basis. However, we will not be giving you legal advice in here. Legal advice is something you pay for, not something you get at a convention panel. <laughs> Unless you have found me through conventional means, contacted my office, scheduled an appointment, came down, sat down, meet with, met with me, had me agree to take your case, paid me a fee of my choosing. Don't just walk up here and put a dollar in front of me. <laughs> Received and signed an engagement letter. You are not my client. I do not represent you. I will not be providing you with legal advice. And you're in a room with like 30 other people. There is no attorney-client privilege to anything you say. That said... Please do not coach your questions as hypotheticals. Hypothetically, if my car was filled with cocaine right now, I know what you mean. My friend has an issue. I know the friend is you. We all know this. Guys, we are attorneys. We smell bullshit like fat kids smell cake. That said, who's got a question? Yes. What's your persona? <laughs> I keep trying to tell you not have a fursona. I am furry adjacent. Yeah, so is he. Yeah, we, <laughs> so, trust me, the problem is, and the reason they're not believing you is I said that for like five months, and I'm like, I'm a fucking badger now. You started out saying... I'm gonna be I was, a mother I was talking badger. in a hypothetical I event. read that in black and white. And then you backed up for five months. Yeah. That is the difference between us. Yeah, the, the best thing is, by the way, you guys like fell in love with lawyers and we don't know why. Like, no, no shit. The furry community has confused lawyers nationwide over the last year and a half. I found furries, uh, like, okay, when somebody's like, how did you find furries? Like, when this opened a whole new like, guys, I grew up in, in, with the internet. Like, I knew furries existed. The closet door didn't open one day, and there I was, huddled in the corner, having been shielded from the world. And I'm like, oh, there's giant animal people. I, I was tangentially aware of the furry fandom. And we were in a, uh, a community called Lawyer Smack. It is a community at the time uh, before they started charging an entrance fee so that we could kind of keep track of the membership better. Uh, Lawyer Smack had well over 500 attorneys nationwide and really worldwide in it. It was kind of like an online watering hole for lawyers. And I've been there since there were like 25 lawyers in it. Uh, so I'm a member of the old guard. And it was the RMFC meltdown and somebody posted that cease and desist letter in the chat room, and I had not yet written an article for my site the next day, so I read it, criticized it, and watched some shit about furries to get an idea of what I was talking about, and posted it, and you assholes blew up my website. <laughs> and then I started having to go places, and like every lawyer immediately was like, what the hell's going on? What? Like, there are, there are hundreds of lawyers who are in this chat room going, why are animal cartoons tweeting at me? <laughs> it was so bad that the Boozy Badger Twitter account came around because law, other lawyers just, like, sat me down and were like, dude, you've got to create a new Twitter for the furries. Because it's getting a little fucking awkward. <laughs> like, they keep following us. <laughs> And I'm having a hard time explaining to my boss why there's a rabbit called 
called Slut Bunny, uh, following our firm's website and posting art. Um, but I, I should say there was a legal conference last year, and uh, Keith Lee from AssociatesMind.com, who, if you know, yeah, obviously that means nothing to you, but Keith's actually. I wouldn't say he's a huge deal, but Keith's well known he's, in, he's, in the legal technology sector. He runs his yeah. own firm. He's been well known for years. He started writing his website back in law school. He written a lot of books. Keith went and talked at a, a legal technology conference because that's a fucking thing. Um, and he was talking about finding a community as an attorney. And three minutes in, he told the story of me being kidnapped by the furries. <laughs> and how the furries apparently decided that every lawyer needs a fursona. <laughs> Guys, you had a room full of lawyers asking one of the preeminent legal minds, well, one of the forward legal minds of this, this country right now, what his fursona was and being very insistent that he had to give a fucking answer. <laughs> by the way, he's a bunny. Uh, my, my site was nowhere near being a thing after the CSI episode. Um, it's weird, I can always tell when the three articles that started this are somehow becoming relevant to something, because I'll get a notification from my web hoster telling me that the site's stats are booming, and then when I look at it, like a thousand of the fucking reads are on the three furry articles, I'm like, oh, something's become relevant again, I wonder why. <laughs> and then I like watch Twitter going, oh, who fucked up? <laughs> uh, so, so that is, that is weird. Uh, it is kind of weird though, yeah. When, uh, recently when Lucifer did their episode on furries, there was an increase in traffic on the side, like the day after it. Which by the way, that's probably how somebody found the furry fandom. They uh, watched Lucifer, and then they read about a sovereign citizen shutting down a convention. So uh, good on you as a community for putting that image out there. And that happens to us more than you might think because we get associated with some, there's some weird law something else parrot. You know, for him, obviously, it's furries and booze, which I don't understand how any lawyer gets a lock on booze. I really do. Yeah, I, I really want to know how an individual that lawyer. Paid me. But... For me, the one I think of right away is something called Cocky Gate. Who has heard of Cocky Gate? <laughs> There's one person here. So the, the, our worlds do not overlap as much. There is, you know, online, as you can well imagine, there is a large and thriving community of people who enjoy romance novels. Yes, the ones that everybody makes jokes about, but they love them. And they are some of the most rabid fans. They make every, each last single one of you look like a total... Sunday painter, trust me. You do not mess with that, ever. And there have been a lot of people going around trying to make easy money, quote unquote, writing romance novels and trying to monetize them. There are Facebook groups. It's basically the same old, you know, whatever is popular, here's how you make money out of it without actually participating in it or knowing anything about it. It's a tale as old as law, or as old as money. But anyway, one of these uh, Johnny from Lately's decides that he's going to register a trademark. Actually, it was a she, sorry. Uh, I'm thinking of the lawyer who got involved later. She decided she was going to register a, the, the word cocky for romance novels, which, according to her, and the cease and desist letters she sent out by herself when her actual really high-quality trademark attorney told her that, of course you can't do that, don't be stupid, um, and apparently she just went and found one on a website or something, I'm guessing. I mean, this is all public knowledge, and, and while people have retained me in, in association with romance novels, none of them were directly to do with cocky gay. And I don't know how much you know about romance novels, but cocky in the title or on the description of a romance novel implies certain things about the book. To someone who is fond of the genre of romance novels, it tells them a lot about what the story is going to be like. It's a generic 
term as we use the word. It just associates a certain kind of book with a certain kind of story. Going and registering the word cocky for romance books and telling other romance authors you may not use the word cocky in the titles of your romance books or in the descriptions of your romance books on Amazon is one of the more ludicrous things I have seen somebody try to do at any scale in 20 plus years of doing this. So somehow I ran across this, just somebody I knew, um, maybe a client or a friend of a client tweeted about it and I went and looked it up and I was like, that's crazy. And I wrote a little blog post about it. We all know what happens when you write little blog posts about crazy things. <laughs> the next thing I know, I'm getting thousands of hits per hour because the entire romance community, including a couple of at least fairly big mid-level authors, starts tweeting links to my, here's what's going on with copy gate blog posts. And now I can tell, just like him, whenever somebody does something stupid, read, trying to register a trademark in association with a book, especially anything to do with romance novels, all of a sudden, that blog post starts getting hundreds and hundreds of hits. <laughs> because there aren't any other, every other post, except for very few, which are not bad, but I was there first, apparently, basically is just, here's what an actual attorney had to say about it, and a link to my post. So if you search for cocky gate or trademark and romance novel, you end up at my website. So that's, that happens to us because we're on these weird niches. And you know, he picked the, the funner one, probably. At, at, least, <laughs> at least the fuzzier one. Well, I'm, I'm never running out of topics with you assholes. <laughs> but it, it, it happens, and I've seen it happen to other lawyers who are in those very specific niches that are small, but some reason they blow up, and it's really interesting to watch. Yes. Uh, the cocky gate cock. Uh, I, I suspect that one's already taken by some romance novelist fan because I, I, nobody but one rose, raised their hand. I don't believe you. I know there's romance novel fans in here, and there's nothing wrong with romance novels. They're awesome. And I will even tell you, I have written that because I got bored. And <laughs> not, again, not disclaiming them, but you know, they are awesome. There are people who love them just like there are people who love furry fiction or whatever. It's great. If you're reading, it's awesome. But I'm not going to try and out you because it's not how we, how we roll. I don't believe you that there's only one of you who even knew. And there's only one of you who's a romance novel fan. So. Uh, let's go over here real quick. Okay. Um, have, you, have you ever, uh, have you ever, is there like a story circulating amongst like, you know, amongst the lawyer community that was like the ultimate dumpster fire of a client or something like that? Um, Pick one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, one let that, me, let one me, that personally sticks in your mind. Let, let, let me be very, very clear, okay? When you go to your lawyer and you're sitting there and you're like, Oh, thank God, they can't tell anybody about this. When our bar associations get together, we definitely fucking talk about you. <laughs> like, like, we don't identify you. It's never so much that we're giving away. But, like, if you're a complete dumpster fire of a person, like, when we're having drinks at happy hour with other attorneys, we're like, you will not believe the shit show that walked into my office today. <laughs> Uh, so it's really hard to pick out just one. I will say one that went big nationwide. Wasn't uh, a client of mine or anybody I know. Well, I take it back. It was a client of someone I know through Lawyer Smack. Uh, and you guys may not recognize the name, but you will recognize the story more than likely. David Allen Fenton from the state of Georgia who told the judge to suck his dick in a performance-related oh. hearing that the Rick and Morty creators picked oh, up yeah, and then yeah. animated. Oh. I was there when that one got released to the world. <laughs> that initially got handed around lawyer smack because the guy who was his appointed counsel uh, was a member of Lawyer Smack and somebody else had been present in the courtroom and ordered the transcript of that and they're like, hey, you guys have to see the shit show that so-and-so went through. So we could, like, fuck with him. Because that's, that's what we do. 
Yeah, it's like, hey, you lost that hearing. Now I'm going to fuck with you about it. Uh, so the transcript showed up. We read it. We lost our shit. And then we released it to the internet at large because this is a public record anyways. Uh, and the internet lost its fucking mind. <laughs> and I have to say, that's not the worst thing I've seen happen in the court, but it is the worst escalation of something like that I have seen happen. So, uh, so yeah. Well, I, and I'll go with that one. I'll give you two examples. The one, the one that doesn't have anything to do with me, I hasten to add, I'm just going to tell you a name. And if you want to take that name and put it into Google and see what pops out, that is on you. <laughs> and that name is Jason Lee Van Dyke. Oh, that motherfucker! <laughs> you know, he just lost his license. Just now. Texas That's the just lost his No, you know what? Oh, Fuck it. I'll tell you about it. <laughs> You guys know the Proud Boys. You guys know the Proud Boys, all right? Yeah, yeah. Jason Lee Van Dyke. Jason B. Van Dyke was a proud and open member of the Proud Boys. Who? This is not fucking defamation. He can sue me if he wants, because I'd love to fucking depose him. A friend of mine's already fucking deposed him over this. I'd love to bring him into my goddamn neighborhood and do it too. Jason Lee Van Dyke would go on Stormfront.org and advertise for clients by stating he was a proud white nationalist who would clearly defend their rights. If you don't know what that is, by the way, Stormfront.org he was, he was is a, a neo-Nazi. Yeah, he, he, was, he was a fucking white supremacist, guys. Yeah. He, well, I mean, like, he still is. I'm sure he didn't, like, stop. But anyways, so this asshole goes out there and decides that he's tired of collecting piddly-ass debts from his private law office in buttfuck Texas and tries to get a job as an assistant district attorney. And we don't know who the fuck did it, but somebody outed his ass to the, the DA's By office. the grace of God, the day before he was supposed to start working. This is a person who shouldn't have power over the soda fountain at McDonald's, <laughs> let alone the ability to prosecute people with the power of the state. So, the DA withdraws the offer of employment, citing to all of this, and this motherfucker went to a tailspin. I mean, when I say tailspin, I mean fucking tailspin. Like, he started tweeting at uh, Ken White, who you may know him on the internet as Popat. He started tweeting to lawyers and journalists and everybody involved who was like, holy shit, what happened here? And he was threatening to fly out to their house and beat them up. Like sending them fucking pictures of a countdown clock and a flight, fucking flight listing. He's like, I bet the LAX airport's great this time of year. People are getting fucking restraining orders. Two friends of mine, like not, not like guys I talk, friends of mine were threatened by this man so badly, they filed complaints with the bar associations of every fucking bar he's admitted to. <laughs> This dipshit, after over a year of this, then takes control of the Proud Boys from Gavin McGinnis, who, you know, got caught on tape encouraging people to beat up other people. Um, he's the guy who took control. This is the dipshit who, instead of using, like, paying an extra 50 fucking bucks for the Adobe thing that actually redacts information, just put a fucking black box you can remove with one click over documents and release them to the public, and gave out the names of the entire fucking leadership of the Proud Boys. They fired his ass the next day. And yesterday, the State Bar of Texas finally fucking suspended his law license. Is that on? Yeah. Is that on? Yeah. Hey, Jason! Go fuck yourself, you just oh! Everything he said, absolute truth. The reason I brought him up as a shit show as a client is that he's tried to sue people. Remember, this is a, a person who was admitted to the bar, who almost got a job as an assistant prosecutor, and you know, again, had the power, almost by two-day margin, had the power of the state behind sending people to jail or to their deaths, and somehow was stopped. He has been suing people right and left. And 
you know, you've heard the old, the old expression that a lawyer who represents himself has a fool for a client. That would be like eight or nine steps up for him. Because the lawsuits he files are just gibberish. I mean, never mind, are they, do they have any basis in law or fact? No, they do not. They don't make any sense. I, I, I don't understand this. And this is something that, you know, to, to zoom out just a little bit, I know Lucy's been there because every lawyer with two brain cells has been to rub together. You think we're all really smart, we went to law school, we, have, we passed the bar, which, which is not easy, I'll give you that. And therefore, you know, and we're in practice and we're doing things, no. I get letters every week, every week, almost every day if it's a busy week, but every week from lawyers who have been members of the bar, licensed attorneys, you know, very successful lawyers, many of them more successful than I in many ways, and they don't even make any sense. You know, let alone, does this actually have a good case? Are you asserting some good case? I'm like, what are you even trying to say to me? You know, it's like, never mind, did you pass the bar? Did you pass 10th grade composition? You know, can you do that, that three S, that three paragraph essay, you know, issue, analysis, result? They can't get there. And, you know, I have, I have filed literal responses, although this was not to an attorney, to be fair, that literally said, you know, Appellant cannot respond to Appellee's argument because Appellant does not understand what Appellee is trying to say. You know, the, we respectfully request that the, that the uh, trier of fact ask them to explain themselves because we don't know how to stand to them. But we get that with lawyers, and I know Boozy has gotten that. He's, he's looking for something very intensely, and I won't disturb him. Oh, but, no, keep going. You're fine. But, you know, when you get that letter, you know, you have a website or, you know, you've your driveway is not paid properly or whatever, you get that letter and it's on really heavy, you know, ivory paper and there's like 18 names at the top that all end in Esquire. Okay, yes, you should bring that to us because you will screw it up if you try to talk to them. I guarantee it. You're all very smart and I love you. You'll screw it up. You'll say something wrong. And I'm going to get back to cocky getting on that in a second. But don't be sure that that letter actually says anything that even a regular lawyer can understand. You might be like, this is all legal gibberish. No, it may just be ordinary gibberish. <laughs> but then getting back to Kakigate, the, the author in question who had filed the registrations, after this broke loose, because she had been sending cease and desist, she had been sending takes downs to Amazon, which don't even get started on Amazon, but she then starts tweeting responses to people who are angry with her. And she doesn't understand why they're, because she works very hard on these books, and she's just trying to protect, you know, this, this series that she has made, you know, the, the cocky brothers of Augusta, Georgia, or some such, I can't remember now. One of them was a Marine, and one of them was a Senator, and one of them was a heart surgeon, because romance novels, that's fine. But, anyway, she's trying to protect it, and then she goes on Facebook, literally weeks before she files a major trademark and copyright infringement case in Federal District Court in New York, and makes this hour and a half long video, which I have seen, and she just kind of wanders about how she's good and everybody else is bad, and she makes what we call statements contrary to interest, I would say an average of one a minute. <laughs> you know, just that video itself, I, you know, if she had sued a client of mine, I would have just taken that video, burned it to a DVD, submitted it, and, and titled it Motion to Dismiss. <laughs> and that, that would have been my entire answer, my entire filing. Uh, but it's, just don't do that, guys. So if you want to talk about a, a client who just turned into, that wasn't my client, but who just turned into, like, I think that what happened, and this is speculation, pure speculation, based on observable facts, which anyone can observe, is that she got the registration, everything was fine, and she started telling her attorney, do X, Y, and Z, and her attorney said, no, that's not how this works. Yes, you have a registration, we can use it for certain things, you can't do with that. And she didn't like the answer she got. And when clients get answers they don't like, they get stupid. <laughs> and our job, a big part of our job, is not even necessarily the loss thing and the, and the drafting the fancy motions with words that make no sense, full of bastard French. It's trying to calm you idiots down when you have been wrong. You may actually have been wrong, that the law is not really interested in how you have been wronged. The law is interested in whether you have been damaged in a legally cognizable way. Two separate things. Back over. Oh yeah. By the way, 
Please stop saying you're going to sue people for slander or libel. Just stop. Just fucking stop. Yeah, okay. Maybe some of you can, but 99% of the time, you're pissing in the wind, guys. You really, like, no, it meets all the testing. Okay, but what's the measure of damages? What's that? Okay, you have damages, but the question is, is what is the value of your reputation? I've seen your after dark. It ain't that fucking much. Uh, actually, in all honesty, go talk to an attorney in your jurisdiction, but just to let you know, 99% of the fucking time, it is not slander or libel. And, and in the same regard, it is not fair use. It just isn't. I know you went and you typed fair use into Google and you got the beautiful explanation at Stanford IDDU, which is the first hit on the Google search and it's a wonderful explanation. I look at it myself from time to time because it's so well worded and I blatantly pirate some of the phrasing. And it's wonderful. And you've gone through those four factors and you have determined that use is fair. No, it isn't. It just isn't. Words mean different things to lawyers than they do to normal people even including you lot as normal people, to us, you're still normal. It's like regular normal people, furries, us, okay? That's how this works. So please don't do that. If you have a question, especially if you're just a little, you know, nobody with a website and, you know, nobody in the non-commercial sense, not, you know, every one of us is a wonderful child of God, it's amazing. But, you know, if you're not a big commercial deal, if you're a big commercial deal and you do this, you deserve whatever happens to you. And I don't feel sorry for you at all. But if you're just a person with a website, you get one of those scary letters with the 18 Esquire names, lots of us will talk to you for free and we won't give you legal advice until you become clients, but we'll say like, yeah, you really should think about doing that or I have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> so, yeah. But you know, if you need help, ask. There's, there's help to be found. But don't be your own lawyer because as we've seen, even people who are their own lawyers go wrong very quickly and you're not even lawyers. So please just don't do that. And it's not fair use. You take nothing else from this. It's not fair use. And by the way, if you're thinking, I have found the end run, I will use the legal dictionary when I'm reading it to determine what the lawyers mean by those words. <laughs> Allow me to explain that when we say these words mean different things to lawyers, I'm not talking about Black's Law Dictionary. We're talking about how courts have interpreted each line of that law for the last however many decades that law's been in effect. And unless you have Westlaw, who, who in here has a Westlaw subscription? Who in here has a Westlaw subscription and isn't in law school? <laughs> okay, no offense, just wanna point out, you're what, a 1L, 2L? 3L? So you have plenty of time for a furry, and you're like, fuck it, I don't care anymore. I just wanna, I just wanna get the fuck out of here. Uh, but you should agree, by the way, pay attention in law school for your third year. Trust me, it's, it's actually important. Uh, the way those things are interpreted is going to be so based on facts, circumstances, and precedent because the legislature makes the law and then the courts go in and determine what the hell the legislature meant 99% 90 90 of the time. And unless you have access to that and the ability to read and understand a legal opinion, analysis, and argument, you have no fucking clue what that law means, really. Lots of you are really intelligent, really well educated, and you know can can serve up the fries like anything. I know. <laughs> but sorry, no offense to anybody. That's just an old joke about you know PhDs and would you like fries? But anyway, um, it doesn't mean what you think it does. And in fact, the more logical you think you are, the worse you may go astray. I'll give you my favorite example from my field, which is the word obvious. Who here thinks they know what the word obvious means? In a legal it seems obvious. Just, exactly. It's obvious, isn't it? It's obvious what obvious means. Obvious does not mean the same thing to a patent lawyer that does to any other kind of lawyer, let alone anybody who's not a lawyer. To a patent lawyer, something is obvious if you had literally everything that has ever been published, which might even remotely be relevant to that thing in front of you, neatly indexed, and able to find it. If you could find a reference which someone of ordinary skill in the art could combine to arrive at the thing which is obvious. And I mean that literally. 
There was a famous case where it turned out that the reference wasn't even neatly indexed. It was misfiled in a 50-year-old German university's depository of PhD theses. And they said, well, but it was a public record that they could have found. Therefore, this is obvious, no patent for you. That was the only piece of prior art for that patent in the world. And the court still said, nah, it was there. Now, would any normal person or even a normal attorney have said, well, gee, that's an obvious reference? Of course not. You literally could not have found it if you had gone looking for it unless you literally dug through every piece of paper in that 50-year-old repository in a basement in Germany somewhere. But to a patent lawyer, that's obvious. So when you get your great idea for invention, which you know any patent lawyer will be help, happy to help you look at, but you think, I'll do it myself. There's no way this is obvious. You're just wrong. Hey, that there's something called rules of construction and rules of interpretation in law. Uh, you find them a lot in contract cases. And one of the ones is, unless the word has been given a special meaning by the legislature, we import upon it the normal and reasonable meaning unless the courts have already put another meaning on that word. So you look at the definitions for the statute. Does the word appear then? There. No. Okay. So now we can go to the regular dictionary definition. Unless, of course, lawyers have decided it meant something else over the years, then we got to go to another dictionary and court case determine that, and you will not know that, because this is why you pay us. Okay? Yes? I will fucking gut you like a fish. <laughs> yes. Uh, can you tell me more or tell us more about the, the Proud Boys? Like, who are they? What do they do? The Proud Boys? That's what you said, right? Uh, they, the Proud Boys. <laughs> who are they and what they do? <laughs> who is your daddy and what does he do? They're, they're sort of uh, the asshole wing of the yeah, asshole part. Uh, the Proud Boys are... I, I want to say complex, but they're really not. They are men children. They are a collection of individuals who espouse uh, very toxic beliefs. They, they have a bad tendency to say, oh, we can't be racist. See, we have members of this race or that race. Uh, or, oh, we're, we're not really against this thing over here because we have a member who is that thing. And to that, I like to remind people that one of the folks who was instrumental in bringing the Nazis to power in 1930s Germany was an openly gay man who headed the brown shirts that were uh, Hitler's street thugs during all the politics leading up to that. And you know what happened when after Hitler got into power and the Germans and the Nazi party took power in Germany? The very first thing they did in the night of long nights, they took that motherfucker and they shot him. Uh, but the Proud Boys are very much that sort of organization. Um, they have, I mean, a, you can Google their manifestos, and it is no. it is fucking insane. It, it really is. But uh, they, we don't we don't espouse violence, but we have a subsection that we're calling the Knights who go out and pick fights. If if you were to take, you know, if you expose a certain kind of person to Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land, you get a hippie. If you were to take that same person and extend, extend, expand, ugh, sorry, extend, expose them to Mein Kampf, you'd get a problem. And they are, the best way to phrase them, they are not conservative. Conservative to me is uh, uh, like a, a Republican, but not what we think of as Republicans right now with Mitch McConnell and all that. that Republicans were never easy to deal with if you were a Democrat. They didn't so openly like give passes to things in the past. Uh, they are ultra conservative, far far right Republicans though. Um, I don't even think the Republican Party wants to claim them anymore. I think it's they've actually gone so far right that, that the Republican Party's like, no, you are not. They were, like they do with most. Uh, to be fair, like they do with a lot of those groups. So yes. On to a happier topic. What's the worst thing that a client tried to wear to court? Mm. <laughs> I hate you. Uh, I have
have actually in the past been known to go to there's a goodwill outlet up the street from my office where things come in they sell a discount i've been known to go there and buy a collection of really cheap slacks and white button-up shirts to keep in the trunk of my car and insist that my clients meet me in the parking garage across from the courthouse 30 minutes before their hearings so i can see what they are wearing and force them to change if necessary um, I have I have had clients show up in sweatpants with the word juicy on their ass. <laughs> I uh, I had a client who had been arrested for drug driving under the influence of marijuana show up for their preliminary hearing in front of the magistrate judge wearing a shirt that had Kermit the Frog on it and read 420 blazing it green. <laughs> Clients are fucking idiots. <laughs> I don't go to court that often, so that hasn't happened to me because I do drill my clients and they actually listen to me. Because uh, I just have been statistically lucky, I admit. Um, the two things I'll say is, I practice, when I actually go to court, it's in the suburban county where I live, and it's way out in the corner, it's about as far from Chicago as you can be and still be in my county, so it's almost ruralizing. And there are big signs on all the courtroom doors that say, no pajama pants in court. Uh, yeah. And the one that I'll tell on me is, I once went to a courthouse in an actually much nicer courthouse in a much richer county, and I was just there to file a sheet of paper. And I had something else that I was trying to do, and I go in there, and I was dressed much like I am now. I had on slacks and a button-down shirt. I was not dressed for court, but I was not dressed for court. Uh, and. So I go in there and I go to the clerk and I say, here, I've, I've never done this particular proceeding in that county before. County, you know, clerk of court is your best friend if you're nice to them, always be nice to them. You go in, can you help me? Oh yes, here's how we do it here, thank you so much. Any advice you can give me on this judge, anything he particularly likes or doesn't like? She says, oh, well he's actually in court right now, but he's, he's not in a hearing, uh, he's in his office. Why don't we go meet him? And I'm like, uh, ma'am, I'm not, and she, she just doesn't want to hear it. And she knows what's going on. She's been the, the clerk of this judge for years and years. And clerks, you know, they don't have law degrees and law licenses, and they won't give you legal advice. But trust me, if you're a lawyer, you do not want to mess with that. Uh, so I said, okay, uh, thank you very much. So we go back, and I am just sweating bullets because I am now standing in a judge's courtroom, no jacket, no tie. I didn't have the sport coat on, no jacket, no tie and I felt like such a fool, and that's now my rule. I will not enter a courthouse, even if it's just to use the bathroom on my way out of state, unless I am wearing a jacket and a tie. And fortunately, it was fine. The judge was very nice. He, he didn't say anything about it. He gave my client a very good disposition for their hearing. All's well, it ends well. But you know, if you want to ask what's the worst case of that I've seen, it was me. I, uh, and Mark hit on something right there. And if you are in court a lot as an attorney, you get very familiar with the trunk suit. And the trunk suit is exactly what it sounds like. It is a suit that you keep folded neatly in the trunk of your car. Uh, because you can go into the office wearing blue jeans and a polo shirt and sneakers that morning because you have no clients on your calendar and you have nothing on your docket and you're not planning on doing anything. And all of a sudden something gets scheduled and you have to go to court on an hour notice uh, and you don't have time to go home and change. So you grab your suit out of the trunk of your car <laughs> and get dressed. Uh, I regularly have to use the trunk suit. When I was when I was in house I dressed I didn't usually wear a sport coat for a long time but I wore this but I always kept a sport coat and a tie in my office and I was ready and oh we have a client there's a regulator at the door buy me five minutes while I put my tie on and my jacket now, now I warn my clients if you come by my office on a day when I have nothing scheduled you will catch me in blue jeans and polo shirt because I work 10 to 12 hour days and if I don't have to meet with anybody when I come in I'm gonna be comfortable while I'm there so, yes no <laughs> they do and they don't. Jack Thompson got ridiculed. The bar hates him in Florida. Uh, a lot of bars hate him, but before he got ridiculed, Jack Thompson actually had a very long and lucrative career of being a professional asshole. 
<laughs> it's true. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, you all don't know this, I'm, I'm blanking on his name, one of the attorneys, Bailey, uh, from the O.J. Simpson trial. Well, watch the Simpson trial. The defense attorney who is doing the cross-examination of Mark Furman, he's a kind of a dumpy looking guy, has glasses, big fat guy, but he is uh, George F. Bailey, and he is renowned among attorneys as one of the best defense lawyers you will ever see in action in the courtroom. Probably uh, the best one you will ever see in the courtroom since Clarence Darrow. Everybody talked about Johnny Cochran. Johnny Cochran was all flash, no sizzle. Okay? Oh, it was all sizzle, no meat, sorry. Uh, Bailey was methodical. He hit points. He didn't have to do these big orations and stories to make his points and to make them impactfully on people. Um, is that a clown with the bolo tie? Who uh, really isn't a clown, who's a, actually a really good attorney. Yeah, Dershowitz. Wasn't it Dershowitz? No, 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 no. no, no. Out west, he like shows up in boots and... Oh, yeah, I know who you're talking French about. French jacket. Yeah. yeah. It's all a show, but yeah. he's actually... He's, he's actually a really good attorney. Like, but Bailey was, was a legend. Bailey's a cautionary tale for attorneys, because Bailey misappropriated client funds, uh, was disbarred in every state he practiced in uh, and has been trying to gain admission to the Massachusetts bar again so he could gain admission to the main bar where he lives now so that he could practice in his uh, 70, I think he's in his 70s now, uh, just practice law a little bit. Again, none of these big cases, just small things, and they say absolutely not. It is, and I've Cancer is amazingly hard to lose your law license. Right? And, and not for the reason you think. So yeah. I jump in, but when what gets us in trouble is not what you think. Like filing a bad motion. We can make a really stupid mistake of law, and we might get sued for malpractice yeah. and lose a lot of money. That, that's why we have malpractice insurance. But the Bar though. Association usually isn't going to get too worked up about it. Yeah, they, they don't care. If we don't make a big pattern out of it. They, yeah. But one, if we one, take one, some yeah. of your money out of our trust account that's supposed to be yours, they get worked up in a hurry. Yep. That's what gets us in That's trouble. That is what gets you disbarred. There are, a lawyer can be convicted of a crime and keep their law license, maybe with a, a one-month suspension or a public recommend. You fuck a case up or you don't communicate with the client enough, that's either a private or a public recommend, reprimand from the bar. You, really, you do it repeatedly, okay, you're going to get a suspension, maybe. Uh, for a month to a year. Maybe you have to operate under supervision, you, supervision something. Yeah, you can commit a crime and not lose your license to law, just be suspended and have conditions put on you. I, I personally know attorneys who were arrested for possessing and using large amount of drugs, uh, who lost their license for a year and were required to go to rehab and then gain their license, and they're all clean now, but uh, then got their licenses back. It's really hard to fuck up enough to lose your license, but the number one way attorneys do it, fucking with client money. You mess with a client's money, that is almost an instant disbarment. And that's what they care about. And the reasoning, it sounds kind of strange to say that. You think people would care more that maybe your attorney's out there breaking the law, right? Or they're incompetent. Our job is a position of trust to our clients. If you walk into your lawyer's office, and you tell me almost anything in the world. There are very few situations where I have to tell someone else. As a matter of fact, there's only one in my state that where I have to tell someone else what you have told me or what you are doing. And that is if you are actively using me in the commission of a crime. If you are getting my advice and using me to facilitate a crime, that will cause great physical or financial harm to another person, then I am mandated to disclose that to an appropriate reporting agency. If you walk into my office and tell me you are going to go home and murder your wife, I discretionarily could disclose it, but it's not mandated. And I you could bring a bar complaint against him, and they would listen. Yeah, they the would, bar would listen. Win, but if, if I were to call the police, if you walked into my office and you told me that, and I called the police, and the police went out and arrested you, you could file a bar complaint against me and say, I told him that in the course of an attorney-client relationship. Uh, I asked him what the consequences would be. He told me what the consequences were. I left. He called the police. 
uh, but he broke the attorney-client privilege. He broke that rule, and I want to file a bar complaint. And the bar would open an investigation. Uh, the bar would listen to that, and they would look at the situation and go, is this a situation that justified disclosure? But note, even in that situation, it's not required I tell somebody. I'm just allowed to tell somebody. It turned out later that we didn't. We wouldn't get in trouble. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't say a word to me. There's a whole thing about a therapist's duty to disclose and stuff, and lawyers have smacked that down pretty well and said, absolutely not, because if we have to report crimes our clients are telling us about, then what's the point of having an attorney? And they won't talk to us. Yeah. Which ruins the whole system. So, uh, yes, all the way in the back. Which attorney general are we on now? Uh, today? I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the lawyer slash you. mathematician answer to your question is which attorney general because there are at least 51 of them in the United States. Yeah. I, I, I mean, probably there's like one who goes home and puts on a fucking cheetah costume. I Statistically, it seems pretty pretty good chance. Yeah, the legalization of a woo is, is a lot more interesting because it's not illegal anywhere in, in reality. <laughs> Uh, and Prosecutor, prosecutorial yeah. discretion jumps in big time. Yeah. Yes. Would you guys, would you guys run a, like, a courtroom of furries if we had a, we have a makeup case? Uh, I actually did that at Anthrocon last year. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we, we actually did that at Anthrocon. Uh, yes, right over here. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I I laugh a lot and I say um, I don't get very many normal clients because in, in their own way everything's weird. Um, but it was a a case of trespassing and property lines, and it was trying to determine. Uh, what the rights of access and ownership to a certain alleyway in the city of Philadelphia was. And I'm looking at all this, and it mainly easement rights, like do you have a right to use this portion and that portion just because the person before you used it for so many years, something that we call a prescriptive easement. It's an easement by use over a period of time. And I was looking at the, the case law on that, and somehow I ended up on a case where, uh, 57 cents was apparently stab somebody money. <laughs> like one guy thought he had been cheated out of 57 cents and, and leapt over the counter at his customer that he thought he had given too much money to by 57 cents and change and demanded it back and the customer wouldn't give it back. So the shopkeep who was a grocer took out a butcher knife and leapt over the counter and stabbed the guy on the other side of the counter. Um, was this like 1901? No, this was like 1940 something. Um, Which but is that, yesterday. Yeah, that, that was like, yeah, as far as law goes, that is like yesterday. Um, but it was interesting to see that there was that period of time where that amount of money was apparently stabbed someone money. And that happens to me all the time. It's, it's never quite as cool as that, because I, I don't do criminal law. But I'm a patent lawyer, and somebody will come to me with an invention, and remember what I said, if you had every reference ever in the history of the world. I can't search every reference ever in the history of the world, but I have to give it my best shot. And it's very common for me to be spending an afternoon reading an article about how somebody made an improved seed distribution distribution mechanism in 1875 because and, and you go down there or for copyrights I'll have clients who have invented a game where they've invented an entertainment property and it might be based on a classic fairy tale and then I'm like okay how much of this is classic fairy tale how much of this is Disney and I've spent more than one afternoon sitting and leafing through, for example, the original first, you know, digitized first prints of the Alice in Wonderland books, you know, Lewis Carroll's Alice books, because I have to know exactly what's in there versus what's in Disney's Alice in Wonderland movie if my client wants to do something based on Alice in Wonderland. 
All right, so we got time for maybe two more. Yes, right over here. Define interesting. Okay, interesting to us or to you? Yeah, because because I'm like interesting interesting to me. Um, I'm working right now on a really big regulatory case where there's an FCC complaint involved that I'm negotiating with a city regarding a contract uh, that goes back over a decade and there's a lot of things about rights of access and to me that's really interesting to you it's probably fucking not but I asked you to specify and you didn't so we're going with that as far as me I have done you know I can't say which one but probably the most fun I've had negotiating with licensors is people who create comic books. I've had clients who wanted to license comic book properties for their own products. And I'm a big geek and a comic book fan. And, you know, literally I'm talking to somebody who, like, I know this person because I like comic books, and now I'm talking to them about, let me use, you know, your baby in my, in my commercial product, and it's very cool. And, you know, I've been fortunate enough to do some other licenses like that where, you know, I'll get, I've only talked to the actual athletes a few times, because usually we don't, but I'll be on, you know, talking to, the, to an agent of somebody you all know who's like was a famous athlete, who's now a commentator on, you know, a sports program, and it's just very cool. And that was like one of the few things that my dad ever was interested in <laughs> when I would tell him what I did. You know, I would tell him what I did about a patent, he's like, whatever. And, but I would tell him, oh, and yesterday I talked to Pat Summerall, and he was like, wow. <laughs> I love that. Okay, one more question. Um, let's go all the way over here in the hat. Yeah. Um, have you ever come across... A little louder, please. On one of those, like, all shows, you're like, well, that could never happen, and then all of a sudden, it actually freaking happened. Absolutely not. I'm, I'm just absolutely fucking not. But first, I want to be very clear, we have banned all legal media in my home. Um, Same. because law, like you watch Law and Order and yeah it's really neat for you and it's really fucking irritating for us you have no idea how badly Law and Order has skewed a client's perspective of how the legal system works they're like it's been two weeks why aren't we at trial and I'm like because trials take a year and a half to get scheduled right now well it's not like that on TV well fuck you um, <laughs> It's really appropriate that the guy who created that show has the name Dick. Um, as Louis Bizarre once said about watching these, this is how I feel about it. I watch, try to watch a law show for five minutes, and I understand why Elvis shot that TV. Yeah, and it's, it's bad. And, and the thing is, is like 90% of the most interesting things that happen in courtrooms and law practices and discussions with other parties, the cases aren't sexy most of the time. They're not like, nobody gives a shit that Bob and Jerry have been arguing over a property line for so long, and now that you're bringing a, a trial to quiet title to that piece of property and determine who owns what there, you guys don't care about that. Like, I tell you that, you're like, I would not watch a fucking TV show where that is it's just two fucking old men arguing over two inches of property. Yeah, you wouldn't watch that at all. It doesn't sound interesting. Until you depose them and you find out they're arguing over those two inches of property because Bob fucked Jerry's girlfriend back in the 50s <laughs> and these guys have hated each other for the past fucking 60 years. And that shit happens. That happens all That the happens time. all the time. Something that sounds like it's not interesting at all on the surface is really interesting once you dig, once you dig into it. I had a case recently, it's been going on for four years, we're going to be settling it soon, because after four years, four years of really boring financial stuff, I was able to nail the defendant's ass to the wall on fraud for half a million dollars in a deposition, because I went through thousands of pages of financial records and found that much money in wire transfers. But for the entire time we have been working that case, it has been the dullest case ever because you're focusing on the half a million dollar part. 
thousands of pages of bank records. I shit you not. I have friends in this room who have seen pictures of my office. Do you guys know what bankers boxes are? Yeah. My office, you can't see the walls. It is all bankers boxes filled with file production from this one case. Which not, you know, not that Boozy isn't an excellent example of the breed, but that's pretty much how every litigator's office yeah. looks. They have beautiful offices with nice decorations. You never know it. You think they were actually built out of cardboard. Yeah, my my clients do not meet with me in my office. They meet with me in our conference room because it is the only area in our office whatsoever that is not just floor to fucking ceiling files. <laughs> Probably, yeah. And the thing is, is in accountants' offices like that, like from now till a little after the middle of April. My office is like that year-round. I close a file, I move it to the storage unit, I open a new one. Could be tree law. <laughs> so, I think that wraps it up. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. That was really fun, right? Okay. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm still amazed that after doing this so many times, a lot of you, it's like, I look out here and I'm like, I've seen some of these faces before. <laughs> Uh, so thank you guys for coming to this. I really appreciate it. It's always great to uh, see people taking an interest in their justice system and the law. Uh, one thing I will say, because somebody always asks me this after that, would you suggest I go to law school? Um, the, the answer I have to give is the very last, the answer I have to give and every attorney has to give right off the bat is, are you fucking insane? Um, the real answer is much more simple. You will not get rich being a lawyer. People do get rich being a lawyer. There are Those people are out there who make a lot of money doing this. The vast majority of attorneys do not. You will have tremendous student loan debt. Uh, if you get hired at a firm, you will spend the first few years of your practice being the bitch of an older attorney. If you open your own office, you will stress every day, every single day about how you're paying your rent, your bills, your staff, and your own living expenses. Every single day you will stress about that. You will be tired, you will be cranky, vacations will involve taking files with you, your clients will be idiots, you will hate every second of it. But if you genuinely want to suffer through all of that because you think that you can make a difference in your client's life, everybody's like, truth, justice, in the American way, Fuck that. That's not your job as an attorney. Your job is not fight for the right no matter what. Your job is represent your client to the best of your ability because whether your client's a piece of shit or not, that is how our system works. And if everybody does not have effective advocacy and representation, whether they're a piece of shit or not, the system doesn't work. You're not going to be Atticus Finch. Our yeah. system does not work for Atticus Finch. It actively rejects Atticus Finch. But we desperately need good criminal defense attorneys. We desperately need, frankly, good criminal prosecution attorneys. Our system is what it is. If you think you can be a part of it and make it better and make people's lives better, then yes, you should think yeah, about going to law school. You certainly should. But go in with your eyes wide freaking open. You have to be dedicated not to doing right and doing good, but dedicated to the concept and the study of, and the practice of, and the um, effectiveness of uh, the the law in general and how it runs our daily lives. And if you can do that, if that is something you are interested in, fucking go for it. I, I grew up being told by my father who's been an attorney for over four decades, never go to law school until one day when I was working for him as his legal assistant, he looked at me and said, okay, go to law school. So, uh, that's the answer to that one. Now, if you walk up to me after this panel and say, I'm really interested in the law, I'm like, no, you're fucking not. Please go do something else. Like, drug dealing is a very lucrative career. <laughs> uh, I hear it. The barriers to entry are much lower. Yeah. We're also looking at for you. Both. Uh, so, you know what I've learned practicing law? Because I recently got back into criminal law as well. You know what I've learned? Drug dealers still pay cash, and that's wonderful. <laughs> that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, thank you very much. Have a great night. Thank you.
Silver Gato Man, he bought me a coffee. Silver Gato Man, here is the song for thee. He likes to video all the panels at the cons. You should go and watch them whether they are short or long. Silver Gato Man, you video that's not a jibe. All of you go to his YouTube channel and like and subscribe.